And this is what I found out to make a summary of it. There is no perfect executive. One of the titles of my book is The Ideal Executive, Why You Cannot Be One. There is no ideal executive. There is no ideal parent. There is no ideal child. There is no ideal spouse. There is no ideal flower. There is nothing ideal in this world. Why? Because of change. If somebody is ideal, don't hold your breath. Tomorrow you're going to say, ah, nothing is perfect because of change. And if you know the Bible, the Old Testament, even God is not perfect. Even God is not perfect. In the Old Testament, God got upset with the people because they were not righteous, they were sinners. So he brought rain for 40 days. He brought a flood, killed everybody except Noah. When only one guy was righteous in his generation, which means he was not righteous either, but for his generation it was okay. And after 40 days of rain, God said, this is not going to work. I cannot kill them every time. So I'm going to stop the rain. I made a mistake. And just to remind myself not to do the mistake again, when I start the rain, I will bring the rainbow to remind me to stop. Now listen to what happened. A, God, God admitted he was made a mistake. And two, he admits that he's forgetful. He might forget. So he reminds himself with the rainbow. Who are we to be more righteous than God? None of us is perfect. So if you want to be a good manager and talking to you a new generation, remember one thing. None of us is perfect. I, 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 have, a, I have a crusade against Harvard Business School because they teach people to be semi-gods and they get out very arrogant. Please. The way to be a good manager is to be humble. Humility. Start with the assumption you don't know it all. I don't care how good is your education in Nazarbayev University. I don't care how great of a student you are. I don't care how many A's you got. Just remember, you don't know it all. So the starting point of being a good manager is relax. Open your mind. Listen. Learn from other people who are different. I emphasize the word different because you don't learn from people who agree with you. Ah, oh, I agree with you, I agree with you. There's nothing to learn. You learn from people who disagree with you. So you look for people that disagree with you from whom you can learn. Some people disagree with you, they're idiots, avoid them. I'm not talking about everybody that disagrees with you. You look for people who disagree with you that you learn from. That's called colleague. The word colleague comes from Latin, the word collego, which means arrive together. We did not start together, we arrived together. How? By exchanging information, by learning from each other, by enriching each other. When you start a business, when you start to manage a company, what, I'm giving you the bottom line of all my 40 years of experience. Look for people to work for you, with you, that you appreciate because they disagree with you in a way that makes you a better person, a better manager, a better decision maker. What is it called? The complementary team. Look for a complementary team. Those that complement you. If you are creative, imaginary, entrepreneurial kind of a person, look for a person that is cool, quiet, systematic, detail-oriented to keep you out of trouble. 
And if you are a systematic, organized, thoughtful person, look for a person who's going to get fire under your feet. Otherwise, you're dying standing in one place. You look for a complementary team to make a good decision. Don't try to be the only leader. The more arrogant you are, the worse you are as a manager. By the way, I'm not telling you anything you don't know either. You already know it. Anyone here that is married, look at whom did you marry. You married your complementary team. That's why we say differences attract. <laughs> and why do you need a complementary team to be married? Because to raise a child, you need a complementary team. Very difficult to raise a child single parent. If you're a mother with a child alone, you say, this child needs a man in the house. Because I cannot be a mother and a father at the same time. And raising a business is like raising a family. And being leader of a country is the same thing like raising a family. You need a complementary team. But any time there is a complementary team, necessarily what's going to happen? Necessarily. You cannot avoid it. Although we try to avoid it in our marriage all the time. Forget it. It will not work. You cannot avoid it. It's unavoidable. What is it? Because we are different, what is, what's going to happen? Conflict. Welcome to the real life. What? Okay, man. Now, this guy, give him a prize. Good. Okay, here we go. It's very strange. I have to hold it like this to be right. Anyway, no problem. Conflict. That's necessarily true. But there is another source of conflict. Not from the decision making only. Because we are different, we think differently. You look at the big picture, I look at the details. You go very fast in making a decision, I go very slow in making a decision. We're different. There's one source of the conflict. There is another source of conflict from the right side. What is necessary for implementation? How to reduce risk? See, the way you reduce uncertainty is by having a complementary team. It reduces uncertainty. You see this part of the picture, I see that part of the picture, together we see the picture much better. That reduces uncertainty. Because we have more information. Yeah, I cannot see the total picture. It's like this Zen Buddhism, a group of blind people describing an elephant. Everybody sees a different part. Together we see an elephant. That reduces uncertainty. How to reduce risk? How can you reduce risk? It is how you reduce risk. <clears throat> what will make an implementation successful? Let me tell you a joke, because otherwise it's a three day long lecture. So I'll give you a joke to, to just make it simpler. A chicken and a pig were very good friends for a long time. And the chicken came to the pig, now watch, watch my finger, and was telling him, I recommend, I suggest, we start a new business together, I mean the decision making side, you see that? And jointly we have a complementary capabilities, and there is a window of opportunity and we have synergistic capabilities that we can capitalize on. You know the language of strategic planning? You know the language of strategic planning, no? And we can make a fortune together. And the pig said, what's the idea? I'm all excited, what's the idea? What's the decision? We should start an American restaurant to serve ham and eggs for breakfast. And the pig said, wait a moment, wait a moment. 
what is only a contribution for you is a total commitment for me. <laughs> I'm not so interested. By the way, the idea was good. Listen to me carefully. There was a market. There were the resources. There were the capabilities. The business plan was perfect. What is the problem? No common interest. No common interest. You want my cooperation for a wonderful idea, but all this for me is to lose. Hey, I'm not so interested. Thank you very much. Be very careful with some people who talk about win-win climate. Many times what they mean to say is they win twice, you get nothing. That's not a good win-win. Remember that. That's not a good win-win. You want win-win. If you want my cooperation, what is there for me? How many times management comes to workers and say, sacrifice, do everything. The only thing you can keep is your job. What is there for me? And then the company very successful, management takes millions of dollars in bonus, and you can keep your job. But I want your cooperation. Hey guys, are we idiots? What are we taking the people for, idiots? If you want cooperation, there must be common interest. When there is common interest, people cooperate. We forgot self-interest. Self-interest is what has been motivating the world for thousands of years. We are forgetting it. There must be common interest. Now I have bad news for you. There is no common interest. Does not exist either. If it exists, it's for the short run. For a day or two or 15 minutes or a month or a year or seven years in a marriage, eventually it does not stop. It does not stop. There are going to be conflict of interest. Why? Look at my chat page. Why? There is one word why. What is the word? What is the word? Change. Change. We change, guys. We started a partnership in a business. We had common interest when we started. 20 years later, we don't have common interest. I have children, I want to continue the business. You don't want children, you want to retire. We don't have common interest. Same thing in a marriage, you know. The partners develop different interests. <sighs> Welcome to real life. Change. <sighs> What's going on? Change and conflict come together. Remember what I'm telling you. Change and conflict come together. There is no way to have change without conflict. That's utopian. It's not real. And the higher is the rate of change, the more conflict. The more severe is the change, the more severe is the conflict. Now, here is the bad news for your new generation here, young people. In the 20th century, more people were murdered by other people than in the history of mankind accumulatively. And if that's true for the 20th century, God forbid what's going to happen in the 21st century. Because now we have more bombs, more nuclear bombs, more change, more conflict. And this whole world can go to pieces. It's called destructive conflict. We are destroying the world in which we live. We are destroying the environment. We are destroying air, water. 
because of change. The whole world can go to pieces. I'm serious. Because of change. What to do? Well, stop the conflict. If you stop conflict, what are you going to stop? By definition. The only way to stop conflict is by stopping what? What? Change. By the way, somebody tried to do it already, which cost millions of people their life. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Karl Marx. Karl Marx lived in the time of change, the industrialization of Europe. And he realized the pain, conflicts, that the labor, that the working class had because of the change. So he developed a whole philosophy, economic, political philosophy, to stop conflict. How? Just look at it. On this side, it's called the dictatorship of the proletariat. No more discussion. One party, finish, no conflict. On this side, commonality of interest, classless society, no more conflict. We stop conflict, and what happened to the Soviet Union and all countries under the communist regime? By stopping conflict, what did it stop? Change. Soviet Union was a frozen country in art, in technology, in social development, frozen. And then Gorbachev and Yatsky came in and said, we need to change. And what happened? The whole thing fell apart. The whole thing fell apart. And when, when, by the way, when Gorbachev was on the cover of Time magazine, Man of the Year, I wrote him a report. I don't think he ever read, read it. I sent it, but I don't think he read it. I said, Mr. Gorbachev, you're going the wrong way. The whole thing will fall apart. Does not need to fall apart. It could have been constructive. Not every conflict is destructive. Some conflicts are constructive, gives you energy. In some marriages, after a fight, they love each other more, not less. So I was always wondering why in this marriage they love each other more after a fight, and in this marriage, they're ready for a divorce. Why is Switzerland Switzerland, and Yugoslavia fell apart? Switzerland should have been like the Balkan, like Yugoslavia. Can you imagine a worse condition that French, Italian, and Germans together? I mean, this should have been a disaster. Not a disaster. Fr Fr Switzerland is doing very well, economically and socially, in every aspect. And Yugoslavia fell apart. There is no more that country does not exist. Soviet Union does not exist. So why some marriages are Yugoslavia and some marriages are Switzerland? What makes a difference? Why some conflicts are constructive and some conflicts are destructive? And by the way, it's also true in a personal life. Because you have a conflict in your head too. What should they do? Some parts of your brain is liberal. Come on, let's go do it. Some part of your brain says, are you crazy? What the hell are you doing? Conservative. Welcome to the real world. You have a conflict in your head. For some people, it's destructive. They get depressed. They get suicidal. They get paralyzed, and some people get energized. Oh my God, I'm going to change the world. What is the difference? What is the difference? What makes the difference? I'm going to share with you some.